Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second Navigating Life uh, video program. This is Moss Jackson, uh, your host. Nikki is my co-host. And we have some really interesting slides for you. And tonight, today's topic is, what makes change so hard? And it's part of our overall series, Navigating Life. Uh, by the way, I want to tell you the mission of um, Navigating Life, which is simple that you deserve to live a very long life of success, accomplishment, satisfaction. And most people don't, do not live that kind of life. Most people suffer, they strive, but for most part, only about 20% of our population really says that they're thriving, they're really enjoying their life, they get up in the morning with purpose, with vision, goals, direction, and very importantly, resilient. And they know something about change. So today I want to talk to you about what makes change so hard. And so by the way, I'm going to be doing this uh, on a monthly basis, and we'll have a nice package at the end of about 12 uh, video seminars that really have to do with the art and the skill and the toolbox of living uh, life as a navigator, life navigation. So I'm going to suggest to you the key challenge we face in the 21st century is a, an expression called chronic stress syndrome. I think we wake up to so much stuff coming at us that stresses us, that worries, whether that's about health or time management or work or not getting enough sleep or your kids or money or relationships or bills, your diet, your friendships. And it doesn't matter if it's male or female. In fact, just looking at some statistics you might find interesting, over 50% of millennials, people born since 1982, uh, over 50% have trouble sleeping because of anxiety and stress. They just cannot get this stuff out of their minds. They bring it to bed with them. Instead of dreams and relaxation, they're thinking <clears throat> about the problems of the next day <clears throat> or the regrets that they had that day. And about 60% of women um, between, I think, 20 and 45 report increased stress. Um, so we are bombarded by stress, Don't let you male, female, teenagers, millennials, adults. Um, in fact, I was talking with my acupuncturist the other day, uh, Talia, and we were talking about the elections. And many of us still are feeling the stress of this change in presidency. We would like a seamless move from one president to the other. But this one right now for many, many people seems discontinuous. It's like a, a break. And we're in this chasm. We don't quite know how to get through it. Anyway, she was talking to me about there are people who just won't talk to people from the other political party. It's like back in the Civil War. Are you for the North? Are you for the South? Are you for slavery? Against slavery? Are you for Trump or not for Trump? And the divisiveness is really intense. This is a very, very difficult change, which I think is going to probably take about two years for us to work through. So in chronic stress, we're surrounded by a negative energy field. The energy field comes from our thinking, from other people's thinking. And actually, we are electromagnetic forces that we influence each other by our thoughts and our feelings and our beliefs. And many, many people, if we're living, if I'm correct, in a world of chronic stress syndrome, we're just triggering stress in each other. And we're having a hard time stopping it. And the result of it is this severe impact to your emotional and physical health. And we have a crisis in medicine, I would say to you, that we're a very disease-oriented medical society. And we're living in an age of inflammation, autoimmune disease, and uh, degeneration. So we, our, our health system is not really directed at what can we do to reduce our stress, except take medication. Um, uh, and the pharmaceutical industry is not going to particularly like what I'm going to talk about today, which is really we taking more responsibility to manage our change and not surround ourselves and surrender ourselves to this chronic stress syndrome. So next slide, there's a key question here, which is, what is the key reason do you think for our chronic stress syndrome? So besides all the stresses we have to deal with, I, I think it has to do with our hunter-gatherer brain. 10,000 years ago, we moved out of being hunter-gatherers into being agriculturalists. And, um, um, but 
The problem is the hunter-gatherer brain was in our heads for about 100,000 years, and it has not gone, gone away. In the 21st century, even though most of us are not hunter-gatherers, we're not feeding on nuts and berries, we're not hunting uh, animals to kill, we go to the market and you know we take something off the shelf and we pay for it. But our brains are still in the hunter-gatherer mode. So we're constantly looking for predators, looking for what's going to come at us to upset us. But we don't have predators like saber-toothed tigers or poisonous snakes all around. What we have instead is all this stress, these worries, these concerns, these disappointments that feel like predators. And our survival brain, the brain of the hunter-gatherer, a 100,000-year-old brain, is overreacting to all this stuff. So, as a result, we're in chronic stress. And go to the next slide, slide six. Now we're going to take a look at really what is the big deal? What is change? Change is simply something ends and something begins. For example, you're single and then you're married. You're married without children, you're married with children. Married and you're divorced. You have a job, you lose a job, or you leave a job. You live in one place and you move something ends and something begins it's really not a big deal and in 2017 you probably are many of you when you make your new year's resolutions you're looking at what can you change and make better some of you want to be friendlier some of you may want to lose weight some of you, some of you may want to learn a foreign language well the statistics on change success are not very good over 50 years of age about 20% of the population can make significant and, and positive changes. Under, under that age, it's about 40%. So as we get older, it looks like we get a little more rigid and have a, have a big deal. So all changes and something ends and something begins. It really should not be that hard, but there's a but. To go to the next slide, on slide seven, what is the big deal to what makes change so difficult? Well, we have three big threats to navigating life. To navigate life well, you have to be able to satisfy three basic needs. The needs for control, the needs for connection, and the needs for safety. So life in a certain way is like sailing. When you sail, you want to sail on smooth water with a good steady breeze. But if you're sailing, like I used to sail, and my sailboat was kind of a day sailor without an engine. So I was totally dependent upon the wind and the currents and how I handled my rudder or my steerer and then how I'd manage my sails. And I had to look for obstacles. I had to look for change of current, change of wind, sandbars, other boats. So those, these were threats to navigating sailing. Well, there were three threats to navigating life. When you're out of control, when you don't feel connected, when you don't feel safe. So for example, when you don't feel in control, it's like if you're gonna make a presentation, you know, there was a time when I would get a phone call from someone from a company to send in a proposal. And I'd have about three weeks to write the proposal. If I get a call now, I have to get a proposal out that afternoon. If I don't get the proposal out that afternoon, I probably won't get the contract. So the time is much faster, much more urgent, and not a lot of time to be reflective. Human beings are designed to be more reflective. We're not really designed in a healthy way to react, react, react. But when you start to feel like life is out of control and too much stuff is coming at you, it's like how many baseballs can you catch at one time? You know, um, we can only really do one thing at a time. This whole notion of um, what do you call it, Nikki? When you do multitasking, is is an illusion. We're not good at multitasking. We're good at Picking a target, ready, aim, fire, one target at a time. And when you feel like too much stuff is coming at you too fast, you feel like you're out of control. Loss of relationship, connection, is a tremendous threat to we as mammals. Mammals need connection. We need to feel bonded. So when you feel there's a disconnection, a loss of love, a loss of a friendship, a loss of a fellow employee, it threatens that, that life need. And the other tremendous need that we have is for safety, feeling that we're not in danger, that we can regulate our bodies. So an example of not feeling safe, I'm seeing more uh, college seniors leaving school now, looking for work, and they're scared to death because they realize that you're not really equipped 
to handle the demands of a work life. And they are really scared. And they, they're afraid to tell their parents and other people how scared shitless they are. So three threats to navigating life well are threats to control, connection, and to safety. So next slide. We're gonna take a look now at how people go through life. Because some people handle these changes pretty well. For example, there are navigators, and we're representing that by Indiana Jones. He always seems like he gets in a jam, but he doesn't panic. Yeah, he gets afraid, but he has his toolbox, his whip, his gun, his hat, his horse, and his ingenuity and a sense of humor, and he seems to work things through. Then there's the victim. I love George Costanza from Seinfeld. He's so goddamn pitiful. Also, Larry David is similar to this. These are guys, stuff happens to them. They whine, they complain. Tell you the truth, I hate them. But I really love watching them because they really are good characteristics that represent the victim mode. And lastly, we have The Survivor. One of my favorite movie, movie, movies is The Gladiator with Russell Crowe, where he just does not give up. He fights and fights and fights to the end. So navigators seem to have the best time. They have vision, they have purpose, they know where they're going. And I have another particular skill I'm gonna come on, comment on in a minute. Maybe 20% of us are navigators. About 30% are victims. We feel like life is crushing us. We're not catching a break. <clears throat> and about, I guess the remainder, 50% are in the survivor mode. They're fighting for their lives, fighting for control. By the way, it's interesting. I came across a, a study the other day about people with heart disease and the need for bypass surgery. Um, that requires a change in lifestyle. You can get the surgery, but if you don't change your lifestyle in terms of exercise, stress management, eating, some other things, there's a good chance the um, heart condition will return and, and you'll die, okay? Guess the percentage of people who successfully make the lifestyle changes. Just think for a moment. Well, the result of the study was 9% of people changed. So most people, even though we live in a disease-oriented society, when we're in crisis, we promise we're going to change because we're scared to death. But after the surgery and we're back home in the comfort of our beds, we go back to eating crummy food, not exercising, and going back to the chronic stress syndrome. So again, this whole notion of how do we deal with change, what makes it so hard, and why so few of us are doing well. So I want to now go to the next slide and talk to you about what is the key difference for the life navigator. I think it's two things. I think they have a GPS, which I'm going to comment on in a minute. And the other is balancing fast track with slow track thinking. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, our brain is designed. We have a thinking brain called the frontal lobes, where we love to solve problems, have curiosity, learn, uh, debate, discuss, collaborate. And that's called the slow track. So uh, under that is our emotional and our survival brain, which is fast track. That's reflexive. It's automatic. You know, we have over 100 million neurons in our brain, 60 trillion cells in our body. You know, as I move my hand, I don't know if you can see it, up and down, or I wave to you, or uh, I swallow, or I blink my eyes to get some fluid in my eyes. It's all automatic. All these habits are automatic. And that's happening in the fast track part of your brain, the reptilian hunter gatherer part of your brain. It's automatic. Evolution has given us a gift. We don't have to think too much. But when we start learning a new language, learning a new job, developing a new relationship, we need a GPS. And that's slow track thinking. We need to understand it. We need to take the time to listen to someone else, what they're thinking and saying, appreciate it, acknowledge it. And the problem is this, if you think about like electrical wires, neuro, neuro, neural connect, con connections going from your thinking brain down into your survival brain, think of one electrical cord, one neural line. For every one neural line circuit going down into the lower part of the brain, there are nine or 10 coming back up to your thinking brain. That's why emotions and reactivity is so quick. We don't have time to think things out. And it takes a lot of time to develop new habits. We need the GPS and the thinking brain to develop new habits. 
but the new habit then has to go into the reflexive a fast part of your brain, so it becomes automatic and efficient. Um, so we have a key difference, and navigators seem to be able to dance between slow track and fast track thinking. They're able to appreciate the reactions that come up really fast, and they have a formula for learning new habits and getting it into the fast track, reflexive, hunter-gatherer brain. So I want to talk for a moment now about their GPS, because I didn't talk about that yet. So next slide is the navigator's GPS. The navigator, in a way, most, most people who are navigators live with purpose. They have a, a direction to go in. Like Nelson Mandela had a purpose. Uh, Oprah Winfrey has a purpose. Obama had a purpose. I don't quite yet understand Trump's purpose, but hopefully he'll be able to articulate it when he finally gives a press conference. and will be able to understand where is he leading us. People do better when they have a purpose. They have a reason to wake up in the morning, okay? They have a picture of the future. They have an idea what their life is going to look like, and they're willing to put in the work and learn new habits <coughs> and practice and not give up and be resilient because they're holding on to a picture. I remember when I first started the work and I was living in an apartment, excuse me, just needed a drink. I had a future picture of living in a nice little house uh, with a garden, a backyard, you know, kind of a typical American dream. And that kept me going for about 10 years. And so I could afford to buy, buy a house. So I had that picture that motivated me and kept me going every day. So navigators have a GPS, they have a purpose to wake up to, a picture of what they're developing, and they develop a realistic plan. Where they plan out, they have goals, and they take small actions. And this is really key to understand successful change, which is the art of the Kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N. It's a Japanese expression, which means gradual, daily, small improvements. Do you know, if you made a 1% improvement in any area of your life, diet, exercise, learning a foreign language. Um, at the end of the year, you would, you would have made over a 3,000% improvement. Phenomenal. Just 1% a day. So small actions, part of the Kaizen. Uh, and we'll come back to that because that's really, really key in being a successful change agent. Next slide is taking a look at, before we talk about how do you really make changes, what are some of the barriers to successful change? This will be on slide 11. And the barriers seem to be four. Motivation, effort, perceived difficulty, and negative feelings. So all over the weekend, we had some snow in the Philadelphia area, and I decided to go to the gym. I was really motivated when I woke up in the morning. So I'm going to have some breakfast, and I'm going to go put my sneakers on, put my gym outfit on, and go to the gym and have a really good workout. Well, as I was digesting the food and feeling more comfortable, I said, well, maybe I'll go this afternoon. And then I realized sometimes basing your actions on your feelings or motivation, you're not going to do a very good job uh, changing your habit. And by the way, it takes between 60 days to about 120 days to change a habit. It's not a month. It's a good 60 to 120 days every day making some action in the direction of your desired goal. So motivation is the barrier. If you trust your motivation and your um, desire, your feelings, you're going to probably fail a good amount of the time. Another uh, barrier to success, successful changes is effort. If you're putting a lot of effort and, it's, and, and you have to work really, really hard at it, you're going to burn out. You're not going to do it. Your survival brain will say, relax. You don't have to do it. It's too much work. It's causing you pain. Go have that strawberry shortcake. Watch your TV program. Exercise later. So if it's too much effort, you're not going to do it. Wow, that creates a problem for us. Because if you can't trust your motivation and your ability to sustain your effort, wow, those are two barriers to change. Besides, if the hill is too steep to climb, if the difficulty you perceive it is too hard, like I never really was good at language, learning foreign languages. So when my first foreign language in uh, college, <coughs> I, got a, I flunked it. I, I got to tell you, I flunked it. It was just, I perceived this too difficult. I didn't have the effort. I didn't have the motivation because I, I was too busy dating, running track, and working to afford staying in college. It wasn't until the dean of students called me in and said, Moss, we love you here, but 
you're failing. And if you, so the result of these, the hopelessness, the guilt, and the overwhelm and the failure is that we get emotionally hijacked. We lose our ability to think things through. We give up and we don't use our, our breath. How can I develop a plan of action that makes sense instead of feeling overwhelmed and just giving up? So I think we need a toolkit. We need a toolkit. You know, let's take a look at 13, please, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Your toolkit for change. So not too long ago, I gave a very short video, I think from my beach house, where I was sitting on the deck and I read a quote. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win by Sun Tzu in a book called The Art of War. And I, I said, I'm curious about that. What does that really mean? And I said, when I would do this workshop, I would explain it. I think victorious warriors think it out first. They plan. They anticipate. They look at their barriers. If you pay any attention to what your true intention is, then you find windows of opportunity to practice. Okay? Um, now, Rick Hansen talks about guarding control. Guarding control is you pull the weeds and you water your plants. So we want to keep practicing small changes to good habits and eliminating our bad habits. Okay? Um, now, remember... like it putting in a lot of effort that burns us out and by the way education alone as to why you should change your habit doesn't seem to do very much for example seeing your walls and a guy comes in and says look you you need to do something about these cracks you're losing a lot of heat only about 20 percent of people actually do the caulking hire someone to fix it so that's education. You've been told you're losing heat and it's expensive. We seem to say, well, I don't really see, the, see it every day. I put on a sweater, I turn up the heat, no big deal. But if you describe it as you're losing as much heat as a basketball, picture a basketball and it's smashing through your walls <coughs> every hour and that's how much heat you're losing. All of a sudden you move from a 20% change in habit from education alone so if you have a picture of it and you really can feel the loss, you jump up to 60% of the population will change and they'll do something about the loss of heat. So education alone doesn't seem to motivate us. We've got to find another way of wetting our appetites. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about your toolbox again. I'll go to slide 14. So it's something really, really basic about change, which is important which is the question, how do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? Elephants are big, they're, they're tons. How do you eat an elephant? Well, eat it one bite at a time. How do you make a big change? You make mini changes. How do you change anything successfully? This seems to be what the science tells us. You need to make mini changes. So there's a picture on the slide of a guy doing a push-up. He's doing one push-up. Now, if you can do one push-up, that may be your measure of success. So for example, I'm working now on increasing my frequency of exercise. So every time I go to the bathroom, when I come out of the bathroom, I do one stretch. It could be a side-by-side -side stretch. It could be a forward stretch. Now, if I want to do more, I can add more to it, but I'm not trying to do 10 or 15. I'm not trying to stretch for 20 minutes. Why? Because I want to develop the habit of every time I come out of the bathroom, I'm doing an exercise and, and then I'll increase it gradually. I'm not going to push it because I don't want to upgrade it too quickly. Uh, I, I, I don't want to burn myself out. They know me. If it gets too hard, I won't do it. I'll make it an excuse. But if you could do one push up a day, or it's like flossing your teeth. You want to learn to floss your teeth every night on a regular basis? Floss one tooth. One tooth. Floss it. I promise you, if every meal you have when you go to bed, before you brush your teeth, after you brush your teeth, floss one tooth. Now, if you want to floss more than one tooth, that's okay. But always floss one tooth because you want to keep it small, simple, and easy. 
what the reptilian or reflexive brain wants. They want to make it easy, efficient, and simple. So personal power for change, small steps plus some willpower. Now I say small steps plus some willpower because you don't need a lot of willpower to do one push-up. You don't need a lot of willpower to floss one tooth. It's just one push-up or one tooth. But once you start developing and you start to feel a can-do, you start to feel like you're in control and you can manage the change, then you could always increase it week by week. And um, it'd be great to chart it, you know, so you keep a little success chart of maybe smiley faces or stars. And there's one guy who every time he does one push-up, he goes, yay, yay, yay. And he, 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 chart, he gives himself kind of an emotional shot of dopamine by giving himself a, a little pep rally. So if you want to change, um, create windows of opportunity, which is you can either do it after an activity, like I do my stretches after I go to the bathroom. Some people do their exercise at a certain time of the day. Time is fine, <coughs> but probably you're going to need a, rem need a reminder to at that time do the exercise. And the important thing is do not push yourself beyond the principle or the law of one. Do one 60 to 120 days. If you want to do more, you can. But don't try to set your goals too fast, too high. Keep it at the law of Kazan. One small improvement, 1% a day improvement. And by the time you know it, after, after a few months, you're going to be doing 20 push-ups or doing a lot of stretching and maybe even running, okay? So personal power for change, small steps plus a little willpower. Next slide. I want to give you your navigating for success formula. I talked about how navigators have a GPS. Well, this new one. In my first book, Navigating for Success, my first book, Navigating for Success, which by the way, you could find on Amazon, I write about the very important formula, vision plus plan plus action plus resilience. It's like if you can imagine a map, the GPS, you have a, a direction to go in. I have a dream. What's your dream? Uh, it could be um, saving a lot of money. You need or is it for retirement? Is it for sending your kids to college? So you may have a picture of when you have your kids are 10 or 11 and you, you know, think about, uh, can I afford to put the money in, spend it in a different way? But you made a commitment to invest in a bank account, a 529 program, I think it is, that, that gives the kid the money he's going to need for college. Well, picture going to his college, going for uh, Parents' Day and taking him out for lunch and him showing you around and being proud that you've been able to like support him. Have that vision. Feel it in your gut. That's a vision. The vision has to be felt and seen and touched. The formula also needs a plan. It's not just a wish. Uh, a vision with a plan will give you action. A vision without a plan is just a dream. And we all dream, but most of us end up disappointed because we don't have a plan. Plan is good, but guess what? <clears throat> you have to put your plan in action. You have to make something happen every day. Do that one push-up a day. Do that one flossing of the tooth a day. Every week, put in that $25 or $50 into that bank account. So consistent action, small actions, done repeatedly, develop powerful habits. And resilient. Sometimes you're going to forget. Sometimes you're going to fail. You're going to get disappointed. Bounce back. Get some backbone and bounce back stretch and do it again okay so next slide so and by the way in the future workshops i'll be talking more about this formula it's an extremely powerful formula i use it with almost all the people i coach we actually create a, a battle plan a gps and each week we take a look at given what you're up to let, let's look at the progress or the barriers you're experiencing now the result of having a gps the result of having doing small gradual changes, many changes, one tooth at a time, one push-up at a time, is you increase your sense of power, connection, and safety, which gives you an attuned, attuned, harmonious nervous system. <coughs> if if the power part of your brain, which is your thinking brain, and your connection brain, which is your emotional brain, and your safety brain, which is your reptilian brain survival brain are all 
making positive small changes, all three parts of your brain, like, like three kids who want your attention as a parent. See, we're the parents of our brain. And we take our brains for granted. But if you're willing to make the small changes in whatever part of your life you think is important, that part of your brain is going to feel good. If you could feed and change your sense of competency, of getting smarter, of learning, if you could increase your sense of connection and generosity and connection with other people, and if you could better regulate your stress every day to meditate, to do some kind of mindfulness activity, to daydream, and to get out of the rat race. And don't always look at your phone to try to figure out who's calling you or what email you have to send back. We make an emergency out of nothing. We make danger out of, out of things that are just goddamn annoying. And you need to take some time to take a step back. If you can do that, you will develop what's called a habit wheel, which is you create a cue. For me, it's going to the bathroom. After which, immediately, wherever I am, it doesn't matter, at work, at a home friend's house, I do my stretch. And people often ask me, what are you doing? Do you have a backache? I say, no, I'm stretching. And they say, why are you doing that? I say, well, because I want to increase the habit called taking care of myself. It's part of my improve my body program because I'm, I'm designing my body to live to 125 years. So in my new book that just came out in 2016, which is, um, I didn't come to say goodbye, Navigating the Psychology of Immortality, I actually talk about designing your nervous system, your body, to manage chronic stress syndrome so you can live long and live successfully and really appreciate your relationships and your successes and feel safe. Easier said than done, it takes work. I'm not saying this is with a snap of the fingers. I gotta do my work every day, okay? Um, and remember, these habits take about 60 to 120 days to implement. And we have another slide, which is a bit of a summary. So given everything I've been talking to you about, your nervous system requires control and safety. We have to feel like we're in control of our life. Life is not pushing us around. We're navigating <coughs> our life and making things happen. We're learning every day, developing new skills. We feel safe. We get stressed, <coughs> excuse me, a little dry here. So we feel safe. We can manage our stress. We don't feel like we're in danger with other people. <coughs> so our nervous system requires a feeling of control and safety. Control and safety requires taking small steps for change. These small steps lead to a sense of personal power and a high probability of success. And very importantly, consistently small success leads to navigating life success. <clears throat> you want to be a navigator for life, a life navigator? You need a formula. You need to make small, consistent habits. They have to become easy and repetitious. So the unconscious part of your brain, the reflexive part of your brain says, oh, I like this. Moss or Nikki or whoever is not making my life difficult. They're just allowing me to gradually learn to become more competent, successful, and safe. And next slide, for those of you who are interested, you can get in touch with me and talk with me about the Life Navigation Coaching Program, where we could talk initially by phone about, you know, what are you looking for? Where might you be stuck? And might it make sense to use me or some people who work with me as your Life Navigation Coaches? This is cutting edge stuff. Love to hear from you. Um, and if possible, love, love to work with you. Next slide. So, as I mentioned before, I've written a couple books. The first one in 2010, Navigating for Success. These were actual real life interviews with real people based upon how well they were navigating their lives and for success. And it's really for people who want a formula for how do I do it? How do I make myself successful? My second book, recently written in 2016, I Didn't Come to Say Goodbye, is about how to navigate into immortality, how to extend your life. And because science by mid-century is going to have enough innovations and breakthroughs that will radically extend our lives. The question is, can we live long enough and healthy enough to take advantage of the changes in science? My work around immortality is creating an immortal body and a spirit and a belief system and an action program that will allow you to live long enough so maybe you could live forever. 
maybe. Okay. And lastly, last slide. <coughs> I just want to thank you for attending the, the workshop, listening. I'm not sure how many people are on, but it's great to have an opportunity to talk to you. And if you want to get in touch with me, here's my identifying information. Marcus Jackson, phone number 610-642-4873, extension 23. Email marsallen at aol.com or, or marsallenjackson.com. That will get you to my website. Also have another blog, navigatingforsuccess.com. I, I try to do a blog every week uh, around this whole notion of immortality and life navigation. And um, you also go to navigatingforsuccess.com. So you can see there are a number of avenues to reach me. I'd love to hear from you. If you have any reactions to the slideshow, terrific. If you have questions about yourself, how we might be able to work together, give me a call. Love to hear from you. Until I see you again next month, happy navigating life. Take good care, folks.